we come together to worship, to praise, and to glorify God. For those of you who are joining us online, we thank you for welcoming us into your home. And for those of you visiting us today, we welcome you. A few announcements. Today at 3 o'clock is our first ever Ladies' Lenten Tea, and we hope that it will be something that, that we do every year. Next Wednesday, would you believe it, is Ash Wednesday. And our Ash Wednesday service will be at First United Methodist Church, and I'm preaching, so hopefully you'll come. <laughs> Next Sunday is Noisy Offering, and at 7 o'clock is our Lenten service at Bethany United Methodist. And then February 28th is UMW at 7 o'clock. Thursday, March 2nd, the Churches of the Bridge begin a six-week Bible As always, there will be two weekly opportunities, 10, excuse me, 10.30 here and 7 o'clock at Bethany. Just to keep you abreast of what's happening, the trustees were made aware that there is an issue with the organ. There is a part that's not working and it needs to be replaced. The cost to repair the organ is $3,780. So far, we have donations of $1,600. If you would like to donate, please use the envelopes in the pews and indicate that it's for the organ repair. And for those who have already donated, thank you very much. The altar flowers are presented to the glory of God in memory of Lee Shell by David and Jolinda Shell. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we quietly reflect on the prelude.
again as you're able for the call to worship, it is number 2128 in the faith we sing. Come and find the quiet center. Was crucified, dead, and buried. 
The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. So we come to that part where we share with one another our joys and then we bring before the Lord those concerns that we have in our heart. So happy birthday to T.J. Howard, who celebrates his birthday on Tuesday. It is a joy to share with you that 44 boxes of cereal were collected and donated to the food cupboard from our Wesley family. But I'd also like to share with you and to keep the covered in prayer, we also served 184 families, 10 of which were new. It's also a joy to share with you that we're able to come together for our very first Ladies' Lenten Tea with the women from the Bridge Churches of the Burwick United Methodist Cluster, and we'll do that this afternoon. Prayers lifted for the family of Earl Bush, who passed away. Earl was one of my best friends, Peggy, who was worshipped with us. He was her uncle and the last of his immediate family. Prayers for all who are dealing with significant health issues and for those who continue to recover, or to recover from surgery. We also continue to lift up in prayer all those who have been affected by gun violence, the people of Ukraine and Russia, the people of Turkey, and just people everywhere who are hurting. Let us enter into a time of silent prayer. Oh, our most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning on this beautiful Sabbath morning. We come together to worship, praise, and glorify you because, Father, that is what worship is. It's all about you. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for all who've gathered here, whether in person or online. And we just pray that the message that, that the worship speaks and speaks volumes of who you are as our God. Father, we thank you for the joys that have been lifted. We thank you for all of the milestones that we share with one another. But again, Father, we're very mindful of the names and situations that weigh heavy in our hearts. For those who've just lost loved ones, for those who are battling illnesses, for all those who are in need of your healing touch, whether mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Father, you are the great physician. You know our needs so much better than we. So we bring these names to you. We bring all of those people who have been affected by violence, by earthquakes, tornadoes, whatever that might be, and we lift them to you, Father. For the miracles that are still happening for people days and days after are being found in the rubble, being reunited with their families who thought they were lost. And again, Father, we are so grateful. But we're also grateful for the many hands and feet that are on the ground that are bringing aid and comfort. Father, for the men and women who are serving this country, whether at home or abroad, we thank you for their willingness to serve. For our law enforcement officers at every level, for our first responders, for all who answer the call, we thank you. Father, for the leadership of this congregation and for me as pastor, we again ask for wisdom and discernment as we look to where you are leading us how we can be the hands, the feet, and the love of Jesus Christ, not just in this building, but going outside this building, in the community. Father, we are grateful 
for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Will you stand as you're able as we join together in a hymn of preparation, hymn number 371, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Verses 28 to 44. Luke chapter 9, 28 
28 to 44. Hear these words. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking about his exodus, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were laid down with sleep, but as they awoke, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us set up three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not realizing what he was saying. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. Then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. Suddenly a spirit seizes him, and all at once he shrieks. It convulses him until he foams at the mouth. It mauls him and will scarcely leave him. I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, You faithless and perverse generation, how much longer must I be with you and put up with you? Bring your son here. While he was being brought forward, the demon dashed him to the ground in convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, heard the boy, and gave him back to his father. And all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the inspiration of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture passage this morning is Luke's account of the transfiguration of Jesus Christ. However, before we focus on this portion of scripture, it's important that we begin by putting it into perspective. And in order to do this, I'd like us to back up just a little bit so that I can share with you what was happening prior to this. Jesus had called together the 12 disciples and he had sent them out, giving to them the power and authority to not only heal the sick, but to drive out demons as well. And I would suggest to you that he is preparing them to carry on his ministry after his death and resurrection. It was after the twelve had returned to Luke writes about the feeding of the five thousand, which would it surprise you to know that other than the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, it's the only miracle that is included in all four of the Gospels. Nevertheless, beginning with verse 18, Luke recounts that Jesus had been spending time in prayer. And after he finishes praying, he asks the disciples, who people are saying he is. Luke writes that they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets from long ago has come back to life. Now Jesus is not going to let go of this, so he poses to them a very direct question, one from which there will be no wiggle room. This time Jesus says to Peter, but what about you? Who do you say I am? Peter steps up and becomes a spokesperson and tells Jesus, the Messiah of God. Now Jesus warns them not to share this with anyone else and then proceeds to not only predict his death, but also shares with those gathered the cost 
of following him. Jesus tells them that he will suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, be killed and be raised from the dead three days later, which is a lot for these faithful followers to take in. Jesus also shares with them what it will cost them to follow him, that those who want to follow must take up their crosses and follow him. Now we pick up as Luke continues that it's about eight days after these events have occurred and Jesus takes three of the disciples, Peter, John, and James with him up on the mountain to pray. We need to understand that Peter, John, and James have become Jesus' inner circle. So it would seem quite understandable that he would choose them to accompany him on a journey that would be very important to him and his ministry. In fact, in one of the commentaries that I read, the author wrote that this event, along with that of Jesus' baptism, is another hinge moment in Jesus' ministry. Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist in the River Jordan being the start of the first phase of his earthly ministry and the transfiguration being that of the second phase of his ministry, which will begin his final journey to Jerusalem. But with both events including an affirmation by God. Luke writes that while Jesus was praying, something quite amazing happened, that his face changes and his clothing became as bright as a flash of lightning. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that I've heard every detergent manufacturer under the sun promise that if you just use their product, that your clothes will be whiter than white and your colors will be brighter than bright. Now, I have never heard a commercial promising to make your clothes as bright as a flash of lightning. But I'm also pretty sure that there are no products in stores today that could make my clothes come anywhere near as bright as Jesus' appearance on the top of that mountain. Nevertheless, while Jesus is praying, he's joined by Elijah and Moses, and when the disciples who had been sleeping while Jesus was praying, something that they will do again. They became fully awake, and they too see Jesus' glory, but they also see Moses and Elijah, who were getting ready to leave. We read that Peter, who Luke writes, doesn't know what he's saying, offers to build shelters for the three, and while Peter is speaking, they're enveloped by a cloud. And the disciples were frightened. They heard a voice from the cloud that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. God again speaks in an audible voice, placing his stamp of approval on his son for them to hear. It's important for us to understand that this moment is the most dramatic recorded evidence of Jesus' relationship with God. Luke completes this portion by writing that the disciples kept this to themselves and they told no one what had happened. It is interesting that in Mark's account, he wrote that after Moses and Elijah depart and Jesus was alone with the three disciples, he specifically instructs them not to tell anyone until after the resurrection. As we read a few moments ago, Peter is so shocked and amazed by what he's just witnessed that all he can do is offer to build shelters up on the mountain. Now, some may think that this is somewhat of a strange reaction to what he's just seen, and I would suggest to you that there might be one of three reasons that he did this. First of all, it would have been a sign of hospitality. Peter may, in his excitement, have been led to take on the role of host to Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and the sign of a good host would have been to properly provide for the needs of those who were in your presence. It was also possible that Peter was reminded of the feast of the tabernacles where temporary shelters were erected to celebrate the remembrance of God dwelling 
with the Israelites while they were in the wilderness. But there's also the thought that Peter offered to build the shelter so that he could prolong the time that they were spending with Jesus away from everybody else and in the presence of Elijah and Moses, which I will be honest with you is the explanation that I most lean towards. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, it's important to explore the passage of Scripture that follows as well. When you and I as the church focus on the transfiguration of Christ, we do not typically include these last seven verses. And it is the essence of those verses that I would like us to focus on for the next few minutes. It is the day after the transfiguration when Jesus, Peter, John, and James come down off that mountain, and they were met by a large crowd. Not a surprise. Luke wrote that there was a man in the crowd who called out to Jesus that his only son was being ravaged by a spirit that seizes him, causing him to scream and suffer convulsions. The man tells Jesus that this spirit rarely leaves his son. Moreover, he tells Jesus that he brought his son to the disciples, but they could not drive out the demon. We're then given another glimpse into the humanness of Christ as he seems to, be, to become a bit angry. And after a bit of rebuking to the disciples that were gathered around him, as well as the demon possessing the man's son, Jesus heals the boy. I would suggest to you that part of Jesus' anger may have been that he had already given the disciples the power that they needed to drive out demons. And according to what Luke has written, they were unable to do that, at least in this instance. Luke completes his passage by writing, and all were astounded at the greatness of God. While everyone was amazed at all that he was doing, he said to his disciples, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into human hands. Now, I want you to picture, if you will, what it must have been like for Jesus. He had just spent time on the top of a mountain with his closest friends, had a conversation with Moses and Elijah, and once again was affirmed by his heavenly Father. What an amazing mountaintop experience. And now, he's come down off the mountain, he's back in the real world, knowing full well what lies ahead. And the first thing that he has to do is take care of something that the disciples that were left behind have been unable to do. It would be totally understandable that he would have been upset. And I want you to consider for a moment how different the outcome would have been for that father and his son had Jesus allowed Peter to build the three shelters and had stayed up on the mountain. Now I want you to take it a step further and consider how differently things would be for you and me had Jesus stayed up on the mountain instead of coming down. You and I need to fully understand that as soon as Jesus chooses to come down from the mountain, the events that will culminate with his death on the cross will be put into motion. <clears throat> Wednesday evening, you and I will come together with the churches of the Berwick Cluster, the bridge, as we share in the Ash Wednesday service, which marks the beginning of the 40-day season of Lent. Our theme this year is reflecting on the 250th anniversary of the hymn, Amazing Grace, and how the words of this beloved hymn relate to the lives of not just those in the Bible, but to you and me as well, as we too experience God's amazing grace. We will be reminded of Christ's sacrifice as we celebrate Holy Communion and have that opportunity to again receive the imposition of ashes. But we need to be reminded that we have the gift of salvation because of Jesus Christ choosing to come back down again knowing full well 
what was ahead. Let us pray. Father God, how we long to experience those mountaintop encounters with you. When we've been touched ourselves or have been witnesses to your presence, we have, like Peter, sought a way to stay on the mountain. But we know that is not what you want. We know you want us back in the world, the world into which you sent your Son and Savior. As we go about our week, may we be used to make your presence known to a hurting world, not just on mountaintops or in clouds but in the day-by-day -day world in which we live. We pray this in the blessed name of your Holy Son. Amen. If the ushers will come forward, we will have a giving of our tithes and offerings. Let's join together in our closing hymn, Glorious Things of These Are Spoken, hymn number 731. <laughs>
Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.